welcome BuzzFeed News senior reporter Ryan Broderick and The Verge reporter Julia Alexander for a conversation about the sizzling competition Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Quibi, Spotify, and a wealth of other companies are battling for our attention. As you know, we were supposed to bring these discussions about digital structures to physical spaces, but then COVID-19 happened and we have since migrated online. So thank you for joining us here. Uh, make sure to keep up to date with our latest by subscribing below and check us out on digitalvoid.media for all future live streams. Tonight, Julia, Ryan, and Jamie will have a discussion for the first 30 minutes, followed by a 30 minute question and answer from the audience. You can leave your comments and questions in the chat on YouTube on the right side of your screen. Uh, first, Julia Alexander is a reporter at The Verge who covers YouTube and the streaming wars. Uh, Ryan Broderick is a senior reporter at BuzzFeed News. And Dr. Jamie Cohen is the founder of the New Media Program at Malloy College. He is a digital media culture expert with a specific focus on YouTube, memes, emergent media, and digital media literacy. Thank you all for joining here tonight. Thanks, Josh. <laughs> cool. All right. So this is a, a topic that's really, thank you guys so much for being here. As Josh said, it's um, traditionally this would have been hosted in public. That was our original intention, but obviously I think all of us want to be in public at this point, but it's uh, it's one of those things where we do our best and we stay vigilant to what's necessary to make this go faster. But thank you guys so much for being here. You guys are the experts of this field. And this topic is extremely near and dear to my heart because this is way back, like I used to be a television producer. I produced really different types of television, mostly reality and nonfiction. But at the time I was producing, I was uh, it was right around the time of the DTV Act of 2006 when it switched to the end of television as we know it. So at that point, the, the bill was sent into law and it turned television turned off in 2009. That was right when I was in my master's and I wrote my uh, thesis on web series and how web series, although they were like really um, branded as like this very independent media that was distinctly separate from traditional television, had just basically perpetuated the former models of the, the systems. But what we're dealing with today in the present is really a, a, a really latency on a war, a streaming wars that should have happened at that time, but really took many years for the industry to kind of figure out distribution platforms and everything. So you guys are like the experts on this. So I really wanna ask you questions about what are the streaming wars and what makes them really important to now and the future. So really the, the first question I'm gonna pose out there is, we. The term has been around for a few years, the streaming wars, but what type of war is it? Is this a war of attrition or is this a war of empire? Uh, I'll, I guess I'll start. Uh, <laughs> it's a good question. And I actually think of it in terms of it's a war, quote unquote, between the idea of a prestige, high budget production that comes from um, mega corporations, when we think of Disney, when we think of uh, Netflix now, versus what I would argue is extremely independent content creators, which is what we think of with YouTube and Twitch and TikTok. And both are competing for the number one currency in the space, which is your attention. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you, they can grab your attention, then they're going to find ways to uh, monetize that. So that could be subscription services that we see with Netflix. That could be advertisement supported services that we see with Tubi. And they get their ads via being able to go to advertisers and say, we have 25 million users who come in every single month. Or you have people like us uh, or companies like TikTok and YouTube and Twitch who find ways to monetize via advertisements for the companies and then the creators themselves via merchandise and via Patreon and, and via additional services that they kind of do. Um, so I think that is actually the war. It's not so much that there's a war between Netflix and Disney, which are more complementary to each other. It's this idea that they are competing against people who are spending time on their phones at night watching TikTok or watching YouTube videos that are not spending time watching Netflix and Disney. I see, okay, that makes sense. And, and if I can add to that, and I, I feel like, Jamie, you'll be kind of, you'll have thoughts about this too, which is that like, for a long time, there were tons of different types of print media and they didn't compete. They didn't, you know, like you don't think of a comic book competing with a novel or like a newspaper competing with a novel. Right. And for, for a very long time, there weren't that many forms of video. There were TV series, there were mini series, there were movies. That was kind of it. And over the course of like uh, Web 2.0, I guess, you'd have, you know, every once in a while you'd have like a vine appear and it's like, oh, what is this? this is a brand new thing. And then it would die. And it's kind of gone back and forth like that up until very recently. And now we have 
so many different kinds of video that we're still though stuck in this idea that they compete with each other when in fact like a TikTok and a Netflix show have nothing in common other than they both require a camera to make them. Right. And so I do think it's kind of a weird holdover that a lot of these companies that were TV movie companies are trying to go into the digital space and they think like, like Quibi, sh like for instance, should think of a Quib or whatever as a different thing than Netflix, but they're still trying to like shoehorn that binary in, even though I think since the pandemic, especially that binary is gone and it's not coming back. Right. I think that's a good, that's a really good point. So that's, that harkens back to the idea of like, why this is a latency? Like, why is it now when it could have been years ago? I think this is like the models trying to figure out where they are actually situated. And you're speaking to like uh, the idea of niche audience, like this very specific types of audience. So the, the industries and the content are bending towards the audience needs rather than like working towards like, what it would have been if it was in traditional media landscapes, it would have worked towards whatever the studio demanded of it. And so it's like to see the audience have, that's a lot of control that the audience kind of gets from it. However, there's, it's still like, unfortunately leads to like exclusivity. So it's like there's, while TikTok is an accessible format, it's still exclusive to a certain type of production or a certain type of outlet or distribution point. And then like our major platforms like Netflix or Amazon, those are exclusive shows that have like licenses. So it's like they're they're within those platforms. So like, what do you guys think about like the amount of control the audience has in, in bending the way that these systems have happened? <laughs> um, the, that's a really good question. And I think what we've seen the companies kind of gather around is where the audience will, where the audience goes, they will follow. And the idea of that, we can look back at Netflix. When Netflix first launched the idea of streaming, um, everyone was licensing to them because Netflix, no other company was thinking of going to direct to consumer at the time. They thought, well, Netflix is going to pay us a lot of money. And at the time we're thinking of TV, we're thinking of our, our big film studios, uh, sorry, we're thinking of our big film projects that are going to theaters. We're fine not having this direct to consumer streaming platform. And then audiences started going, well, my phone now streams at a pretty high rate. My laptop does pretty well. I have my, my television here that I can stream to via Chromecast or Apple TV or whatever it is. Um, I don't actually want to go out as much anymore. Ticket prices are rising. Broadcast TV is no longer appointment. So I'm just going to continue using Netflix. That is everything that I want to be. And I can start binging, which was a word that up until Netflix wasn't really used with entertainment. <laughs> so what the company started doing was realizing that their audiences were going direct to consumer and they could just market toward them directly. And then what we saw from that was the IP war, which is what do you own that people will come to you for? We saw that with NBC Universal saying we're going to pay a lot of money to have the office on TikTok. Warner Media saying we're going to pay a lot of money to have friends on HBO Max. And of course, Disney going, we're just going to take all of our IP because that's what we have. And we're just going to make Disney Plus. And within 24 hours of them launching their service, they have 10 million subscribers because they had the idea of Star Wars is a thing people like. And we're going to make a show about it. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> and I think what they realized was they can get the audiences to come to them as long as they give them what they want. And what they want is a ton of content at once that is of low price uh, and that has IP that they recognize. And that's where you saw all these companies realize the major corporations, which we think of as Warner Media, uh, NBC Universal, Disney, which now owns Fox, um, and then Netflix as its own thing, kind of realize this is where we're going to operate in, and now we're just competing against each other to have the most exciting IP and the most content at once for people. That that does sort of seem to be like the major conflict of all of these things, which is like you have these walled off cul-de-sacs of intellectual property, and then you just have like a free for all between TikTok and YouTube and Twitch where the intellectual property is just the person sort of. Uh, and then, and the format doesn't make any, you know, doesn't line up with anything. And I feel like as those cul-de-sacs become more intense, it actually leads to in a weird way. Like I do think if they're not, they're not careful, Disney and these things will get left behind because they, they do run the risk of making it feel like intellectual property is uh, a thing of the past, especially when you look at like something like Bon Appetit, which technically has IP, but their YouTube channel isn't anything like Disney Plus. It's 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 just like it's vibrant and it feels exciting because it doesn't conform to an episodic structure. It's just a thing that you watch. And I do wonder like if that's where this goes is like a counter 
revolution and we go we go away from that and i think that's a really good point and what we're kind of seeing it's actually probably the most important point and what we're, we're seeing with a lot of the networks realize is that they can't compete with if they don't have the ip to go off of that disney has they can't compete with youtubers they can't compete with twitch streamers who have built these huge audiences of, of diehard fans with that level of parasocial relationship that those, fan, those fans are going to be there every single day so what you're seeing companies legacy companies like viacom cbs do is partner with youtubers to create shows for nickelodeon and what that reminds me a lot of, and Jamie, you'll remember this because of the time you were in television, was when Disney Channel realized they had to compete with Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. And their way of doing it was, we're going to take teens who could be superstar singers and give them shows and then also pack stadiums with them. And that led to the Jonas Brothers. It led to Miley Cyrus. It led to mm -hmm. Selena Gomez. The greatest um, musical artists of our time. Of our time and high school musical. And that set up the Disney Channel to be the success that it was in the mid-aughts. And now we're seeing... The, the companies do it again, the major networks, but with YouTubers and TikTokers and, and Twitch streamers who they're saying, we want to take what you're doing and just do it on a 60, a 30 minute to 60 minute format for us. Um, actually, and wait, Julia, you, you and I were actually talking about this on Twitter uh, about ESPN uh, having like really awkward growing pains trying to do esports in a linear TV model right. because it turns out that if you ignore a culture for a decade or more and let it develop by itself, it doesn't resemble professional sports broadcasting. It resembles essentially like a CCTV footage of a doctor's waiting room where people are swearing and playing Super Smash. <laughs> and so, and and there's a, as you said, this parasocial relationship. And I mean, it's it's incredible to watch TV executives, I guess, just go like, oh, wait a minute. I think people want to be able to hear the video game players talk to each other and they want to know them ahead of time. And all of these things that we've sort of on the internet, I think just like blown past them. And now we're watching these massive companies try and, and also professional athletes, like the example this week of the uh, NASCAR driver who, right. you know, said hate speech while playing a virtual racing game. And now his career is over. And it's like, but on the internet, we dealt with those, we've been dealing with those issues for seven years, you know, 10 yes. years. And yeah. so it is really weird to see the pandemic force these incredibly old models into our world now. Welcome. Well, that, that, that brings me to the question, like, so one thing that you made me just rethink completely from like years, because this is like a conversation that people have been having in academia and like everywhere for years is like, where do these models come from? And what you're saying is something that I don't think a lot of people talk about is that Newer model, newer television models are going to be a bottom up model rather than this top down model. I, I do remember like, look at SNL. I mean, like at Nickelodeon's like all that like was a, a factory to make influencers. And like we didn't think of it that way at the time. And those influencers became traditional media influencers. And then when uh, Will Ferrell made Funny or Die, he was kind of like figuring out like how he could bring uh, celebrities down to that space. And so he was mimicking these odd cringy formats, the way that Zach Galifianakis did between two forms, between two ferns. And like, you had, he had to kind of mimic the platform that was they were working on. But now it's kind of like inverted where they're bringing up a lot of like, like the ultimate collabs of like bringing up like influencers that have started from scratch, started from like nowhere. Now they're coming up into the traditional space, which is now getting like muddled in between. So what do you guys see like, I see Ryan like twi uh, like squirming at that a little yeah. bit. I'm wondering, I think that where I'm going with this is like, do you see um, in the as it bends towards the future, the pandemic excel? Do you think it accelerated what would have happened anyway, or is this just something that's distinctly different because of what what's going on? So you said a thing to me in a car ride on, I believe, the Long Island Expressway, Expressway. Like, like seven exactly. years ago. Wow. That I has changed my entire thing of the internet. And I feel like we have to bring it up because it's really important for this, which is that you called a Vine video mm -hmm. a sentence in the grammar of video. Mm -hmm. And what I think TikTok has done, and YouTube as well, is cr basically created the full grammatical thesaurus dictionary structure of how video works. And so now what mm -hmm. we're doing is once we once we figured out what a sentence is, which is about six seconds, and we can figure out like how that works, and then that loops and it makes sense. We know what that is. And once that happened with Vine, it allowed us to build an entire uh, storytelling language within video that uh, is now moving so fast. And especially now that we're all home and bored and have phones that live in our pockets that have <laughs> cameras on them. We can we can create the grammar of video faster than we've ever been able to. And so what you're I think 
there is obviously the like bottom up idea of celebrity, which has taken a very long time because like still Tyler Oakley, I think of him as like King influencer. He's still God love him struggles to go into the mainstream. Hannah Hart has done, I think a a couple episodes of Brooklyn nine, nine, that leap is a tough one, Mm -hmm. but the like formats and creative structure and the way we think about video, like is changing faster than ever. And it's moving at a clip because we're bored and now we can actually understand how to create structures that don't have to be a TV episode or a movie. And that's like, that's game changer. Everything changes from there. Right. I think adding on to that, uh, 100% right between the dawn of television. And then up until 10 years ago, the idea was that content is King. If long as you have the content, people would come to you. Content is now King maker and platform is King. That's what the change is. The change is that the distribution methods are changing to fit the content. Uh, I'm sorry, the content is changing to fit the distribution makers, um, which is why you get the shorter content, which makes sense for a lot of people. And we're now conditioned from Vine up to now with TikTok that we can do these six second or 30 second videos with Instagram. And that's good for us. Like that so that serves a, a specific type of appetite that we have for content. Um, what you're seeing is all the corporations trying to figure it out where they're going, how do we compete with this? YouTube for so long was the short, um, was the short video platform. Now they're trying to figure out how to compete with TikTok while Quibi is trying to figure out how to compete with YouTube. Like <laughs> they're, all Quibi. Chasing, they're all chasing each other and they're trying to figure it out. Um, every once in a while you have a Game of Thrones, which it doesn't matter where it is, people will flock to it and they will watch it. But more than anything else, you need to figure out how to create content that will serve your distribution platform, not a distribution platform that will serve your content. Yeah. Um, like that's genuinely the way that I see it. And I think that's where influencers really come in is that they know how to use a phone and they know how to film for a phone and they know how to serve an audience on their phone. And that's where Disney can take their two hour things, bring it down to an hour and have a Mandalorian where it's like, we can serve our audience who are over here and want something specific out of us. But what they're all learning to do is go direct to consumer. And that's something that happened very quickly. If we look at really the the peak of YouTube um, for a long time, it was 2010, 2014. That was 10 years ago. That's not that long in the span of history, especially with entertainment, that companies have had to learn how to figure out a way to funnel all their content directly to people sitting in front of their computers or sitting on their phone and changing their entire business structure to serve that. Yeah. Julia, I want to, I want to, uh, take over this entire interview and ask you a question. (laughs) Um, But so you you talked about platforms being like content maker. And what I think is really interesting is that, you know, on TV, TV stations all produce television shows that more or less could be swapped between them and you wouldn't really notice. Whereas on the internet, platforms inherently shape what you're making. Mm -hmm. And we saw this already where like Blogger, WordPress and Tumblr all look very different. And what comes out of them is very different because the tools and the CMSs are different. And so do you feel like right now we're we're sort of with video in the same place you were in like 2010 when you had LiveJournal, Zanga, Tumblr, Blogger, and all of those things could not live in each other. Like they there was really no stylistic yeah. or operational overlap. One era too. I also <laughs> Incredible. I, like I miss it. <laughs> um, My cultural peak. <laughs> I, I think about this a lot and I think about it if we look at it's the, the question that comes down to formatting and there's two great examples of this. Netflix, think of how you watch a Netflix show, they drop everything at once. Netflix specifically creates television with their with their creators to serve that audience. And and their chief content officer Ted Sarandos has said this a lot. They create their shows to be bingeable. That means that they are filmed a certain way, they are presented a certain way because Netflix knows that's how their audience watches things. That's much different than what HBO is thinking when they're doing when they're asking their creators to create weekly shows. And a perfect example of how this goes wrong is you have something like Quibi, not to hate on Quibi, but you have something like Let's Quibi, get <laughs> mm-hmm. which does something called uh, movies and chapters. And all that is, according to them, is a two-hour movie broken down into five to ten minute chunks. What they don't do is plan for those chunks. All they do is splice the movie up, so it just kind of ends, then it picks up. What we learned from decades of television is that you work around your commercial break. You lead up to your commercial, you come back from your commercial. Mm-hmm. And that's how people are watch TV shows. That's what Quibi wants to do is reinvent the way people watch movies, which is an ambitious goal. And I give Jeffrey Katzenberg a lot of credit for wanting to do it. But then you have to re 
format how you're shooting movies to hit those kind of endpoints that are essentially creating commercial breaks in movies. Otherwise, you just get something that is licensed to TNT, like Star Wars is playing on TNT, and it's like, this is where it ends, I guess, at this point, and we'll just come back to it. And it doesn't make sense. What the great companies will do going forward is realize that they have to fit their content to their distribution platform, and that means changing the entire creation process, in my opinion. I think that I, might, I, like, I, like, oh, sorry. No, no, sorry. It's one thing because I, I actually, um, I can't, I, I don't want to say who, but I do know a filmmaker who had his documentary purchased by Quibi, uh, who countered HBO. So it was initially designed as like HBO Showtime prestige documentary. Quibi bought it, and he then had to cut it up into ten minute chunks. Oh, wow! It wasn't created that way, yeah. and I haven't watched it. I don't have Quibi, but um, <laughs> I have too many streaming apps as it is. But I, I think that like Quibi's massive desire for intellectual property is resulting in in some extremely awkward like ham fisting of you know how things work. Well, that's that's the question I want to ask you guys. Like, so I think one, you're right. I think you're right. The grammar of video is being created in real time, which is you're absolutely right. I, I Vine rip. I miss that. It's probably my favorite platform I've ever made. Um, the 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 problem like so. To talk a little bit about um, Quibi and a lot of these different platforms is I think you're talking about something about the the freedom or the release from the clock. And I remember when I, when I produced TV, the clock was God. Like you had to make TV around the network clock. And I worked for Weather Channel, Women's Entertainment, and MTV, and each had a slightly different clock, but they were all pretty similar. They were 22-ish minutes, and they had specific act breakdowns and specific formats that had to go into it. And now you're watching like maybe these Quibi's promise of like nothing's more than 10 minutes, but acts don't always fit that way. So it's like the platforms kind of have to fight with the content going in that direction too. So are things gonna get experimental in the process of figuring this out or are they gonna be a new clock coming out? And obviously this is all in user data and they have so much more data than like what we did where you put on show on air and you just hope for the Nielsen rating, somebody writes this down. This is very much like quantized. Like everybody knows exactly where everybody's eyes are at any given moment. So do the, are, is it going to be like Netflix? Like um, what was it? Uh, House of Cards where it's like shows were made specifically for consumption, that, that term like want, wanting people to binge it? Or is it going to be more like creators input is going to be prioritized for how it's going to be created? I mean, there's even like the weird version where on Twitch, you don't choose the clock. People make highlights of your stream because they like it and they share that. So you don't even decide what's a segment. Like your audience has just been like that. This is what I want to share. Wow. So it can get even stranger than that. Right. I also think about Ryan is like uniquely good at finding or people sending Ryan. Ryan has cultivated a good fan base that sends him the weirdest videos um, that he then shares because he's a good friend. Uh, and I think about them a lot because it's like this is how people are experimenting with weird video. They're they're going they're creating videos that are meant to be memes in a lot of way. Um, they're creating things that are meant to be taken that 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 would not have made sense two years ago, three years ago in the format that they're presented, but they do now. Uh, and I think about the fact that cre independent creators, which is what we really took away from YouTube and Twitch when they first came up, uh, and of course like early comics people on the internet who now make videos, like they were allowed to be weird and, and, and play around with format and do the unique stuff that the corporations are now trying to uh, follow, that they're now trying to replicate. And I think what they have to do is just let people be weird. I hear this a lot from YouTubers who have conversations, who I won't name, who have conversations with Netflix, have conversations with Hulu to do the type of shows and everything comes down to, are you gonna let me do what I do on YouTube, but more polished, I guess. And it, there's always, still, even in 2020, there's still that like back and forth that the headbutting of like, we are a television net studio, we're a film studio, we have to do this a certain way. And creators were like, but this doesn't work in 2020. Your way of doing things feels outdated and that's why you're losing out to us. The biggest competitor Reed Hastings has set is, uh, for Netflix over the course of five years, he's changed it three times. It was sleep at one point, that was cocky. Then it was Fortnite, and I'm uh, sorry. Then it was YouTube, and now it's Fortnite. And those are his competitors. And I think <laughs> what you're seeing him say is like people want to go watch unique, weird, um, kind of really, you, uh, uh, yeah. I guess unique is the right word for this content that Netflix isn't producing because Netflix is now a film studio and a TV studio. 
I, I want to set this up to make Julie's head explode. Um, also, if you take something like the Marvel Universe and you put it on a platform like Disney Plus, <laughs> all of a sudden what you've done is you have taken kind of these two extremely antiquated art forms at this point, TV, episodic storytelling as a TV show, and then like movies, which was a movie now. And then you've put them inside of a platform. Starting this year, we will now see the rise of like the Disney Plus MCU shows. Yeah there's a very good chance that it alters the way that that entire process works because now they're going to try to upstream storylines into these major movies, which then essentially just creates, it turns a movie into like a, like a YouTube channel, but for like storylines within there, like it starts to compress and also blow open what a movie is. What is a TV show? What is a plot? Like is, is Disney plus just like a portal for Marvel and then I'm in there and then that's it. Like what, does that mean? Well, the best part about what Marvel's trying to do, and I think that's actually the perfect example, just to jump off what Ryan's saying, what Marvel's trying to do is so funny to me because they're trying to do the film and television equivalent of what the comics company did in the 90s, and it almost mm -hmm. bankrupt Marvel in the right. 90s. When they introduced the idea that, hey, to read the Hulk number 32, you have to read Avengers 74 or whatever, those that doesn't make any sense. But if you were to read those ones, like now you're getting the full story. What they want to do is, is they're saying, hey, if you watch WandaVision, which will come out, supposedly this year, maybe because of the production delays faced by the coronavirus, maybe next year. Um, if you watch this, you have to watch Doctor Strange to understand a certain part. And yeah, that gets people to pay $20 to the movie theater, gets people to keep their Disney Plus subscription. So from a business standpoint and from a Marvel standpoint that has the built-in stands, that makes sense. But you're going to see other people try to replicate it. Warner Brothers wants to do it with their DC universe. You're going to see Netflix start to go, we can make movies that then bleed into our TV shows. Netflix already does it with their TV shows, where they have universes where they reference each other's shows. Mm -hmm. They already kind of do that. And then there's these little Easter eggs that encourage you to watch other things. Um, and at some point, I genuinely feel like people are going to get burnt out on it. And they're going to be like, this was cute. It's a gimmick. And just like when novelty wears off, and the no we're hitting a point where novelty is no longer exciting. It's no longer cute. It's just like, this is frustrating. I just want to watch a TV show. And I think that's what TikTok, uh, TikTok and YouTube and Twitch serve. Like they have their own language. Twitch has tw chat. YouTube has an ongoing saga within the channel, but it's one off. You go in, it's 15 minutes uh, of, of content on YouTube or it's 30 seconds on TikTok and then you're done and you move on. And I think people really are looking for that kind of passive entertainment they can just move on from when every other major corporation is trying to build this idea of a universe that requires so much attention and time being invested. It's also, it requires, uh, also I wanna remind the audience who's watching, if you guys wanna submit questions, uh, please put them in the comments so we can bring them up in just a few. We'll, we'll cut over to audience in a bit. Uh, but it, it brings to mind the idea of um, uh, hope, I guess it is, or like trust. In the <laughs> As we saw with like Carrie Fisher, uh, rest in peace too, like you can't build universes with the notion that the future is going to just be there. Like we now know like what's right. going, the pandemic was unplanned and here it is. And now it's like, these universes are so big. It makes me wonder like, is this something that's also an experiment? Because when I was watching, when Game of Thrones like was really getting into its like peak pre the last like two or three seasons, I used to think about the idea that when Avengers was on in, in the films or like the Marvel Cinematic Universe was out there, it acted more like episodic television that was big, big yeah. scale. And movies were now just 10 hours long. So yeah. they were just like, well, HBO put on a 10 hour movie, but they broke it into 10 segments. And then the cinematic universes were episodes, you know? So to me, I watched that switch happen. And I was like, wow, this is a real, I'm, I'm, I tried to think about the insurance companies. I was like, imagine how much insurance is on these like, on these actors for this, you know, like because these contracts have to go to the future. Do you think um, independent uh, creators and people who are currently making stuff that's just uniquely TikTok or uniquely YouTube, do you think they are going to start thinking about like this type of universalizing? Like MCN's kind of attempted at this with these collabs, but they didn't really make universe. They didn't create story arcs that were like years long or anything like that. So, so the only insight I have on like where TikTok is headed um, is kind of looking at the trajectory of Douyin in China, which is the uh, walled off sister app to TikTok, basically same functionality, but you can access it inside China. And when I was in Beijing uh, in December, I was talking to a bunch of like new media executives, uh, technologists who were saying that uh, Douyin had become so popular, it was 
decreasing ticket sales for movies because people were using the app so consistently that like they were not eating, they were not leaving their homes. I imagine with co coronavirus that increased. Um, at the same time, Duyan style videos, short form videos, and the influencers that use them have been integrated into China's versions of Amazon. So Alibaba, Tiao Tiao, like all of these massive online shopping portals and platforms have some sort of TikTok component inside of them <laughs> or TikTok like component. I sort of think that's actually the trajectory of our influencer culture here. It won't be as frictionless as they put it in China um, because of like, you know, the free market and things. But I think you can already see the beginnings of that in uh, monetization features rolled out by YouTube, rolled out by Instagram, rolled out by TikTok, rolled out by Twitch. I don't actually think that the a lot of these platforms will compete with the Disney Pluses, the Hulus, the Amazons, the Netflixes. I think they will actually probably just become like digital shopping malls where you can like watch your favorite teen idol perform in the food court and then like buy her makeup brand upstairs, right? We already had this in the 80s, but with a physical space. I think that's sort of where this is headed. Yeah. More so than a competing thing to Orange is the New Black. Yeah. Yeah. I think there are, um, that, I, I, that's exactly right. And I think it's really funny that TikTok and, and YouTube um, and Twitch are not thinking about the Disney's and the Netflix's of the world, but the Disney's and the Netflix's of the world, I know for a fact, are thinking about the TikToks and YouTube's. And that's because for them, attention is uh, currency and they're just losing the attention. And because, mm -hmm. And what that comes down to for them is it's not just that they're losing attention, it's that attention is people are getting what they need entertainment wise out of something they don't have to pay for. And Disney's trying to charge $7 a month or whatever. HBO Max is trying to charge $15 a month. And that's where they're worried because they're like, how do we attract that audience? But on the YouTube side of things, that we are seeing the universe is kind of happening to an extent. And the person I can think of who does it best is David Dobrik and the Vlog Squad, where you follow all the other different channels to keep up with what's happening. Like they'll reference something that happens in another video on another channel because it's like, oh, well, if you're watching David, you're probably watching Heath or you're probably watching Zane. Uh, and you or Jason, and you know that what we did here is plays out onto this part. Um, the vlog squad has the equivalent to what Marvel has, which is stands. And the people who will invest the time into being like, yes, I want to know every single joke and every single video. Um, and so they'll do it. I think that is super hard to cultivate in general uh, and finding a way, finding, a, a, trying to build an audience that will stick with every single video that's not just yours. Like, think so for Marvel, you'll go watch Doctor Strange, even if all you care about is Iron Man. Uh, or for the Vlog Squad, you're going to watch Heath's video on top of David's. That's hard to do. And once you do it, that's the best kind of, I think, currency you can have, which is just, I will command attention and people will come. I, I think this, that's a phenomenal question. I have one last question before we open it to the audience. And that brings me to the question of money, like people making money. So now that we've, the amount of humans now on the internet are watching everything. We're now inside, we are a screen-based audience. This is, I mean, we, this is so fitting. We're streaming this thing, like when this is where everybody is, you know, we're, we're giving people content. But it's interesting that now like, YouTubers are now seeing their advertising sales drop because of the spread. It's now too much content is causing nobody's focusing specifically on their, their groups. And you bring up an amazing point about like, and, and Ryan too, like the idea of like the, the fans now have to be a lot more loyal and like really have to go further than just watching. They have to like really invest in the content. The way you would invest in an app, you also now have to invest kind of into the influencer, the star. And that's going to be like, it's almost Black Mirror-ish, but that's like the, the idea of like having your own unique stream of content comes from a very unique creator. And do you think like executives at like Quibi or Disney Plus, do you think they, they hear that or they just see it as like, we know how to monetize this already and we're just going to try new models? Is this like already in process, do you think? I'm, I'm curious what Julia thinks, but I feel like they're trying as hard as they can to replace people with intellectual property. Yeah. Like... I think there's not an accident that the Avengers have become increasingly CGI based so that if the human that runs that dies, they can replace the Hulk with somebody else. <laughs> People are fragile and made of flesh and, uh, you know, not really superheroes. But if you can invest in intellectual property that can be flipped in and out however you want, well, then you have a much better investment. 
Yeah, I think that's Ryan. It's exactly exactly right. Um, that's why one of the most interesting things that played out with Disney, which their former CEO Bob Iger, who's now their executive chairman, spoke about a lot with investors, was this idea that um, the star, the new Star Wars trilogy, did not play as well in China as they had hoped. And what they realized was the Eastern world didn't care about the Skywalker legacy the way that domestic audiences did. So people in the States really love the Skywalkers. Um, people in China didn't give a crap. Uh, and so what they realized was, but they like Rogue One. They like the Star Wars spinoff. So the world of Star Wars worked really well. So what they did was they just invested in a bunch of Star Wars related things that had nothing to do with the Skywalkers, which is cheaper for them because they don't have to pay Mark Hamill again uh, or, or Harrison Ford, but they get to still make cool Star Wars things. And that's what you're seeing with the shows on on uh, Disney Plus. You're seeing them kind of take the lower paid actors that they, people know that they can work with, uh, and then go, but we'll just create an IP that people buy into. If you think of Disney, Disney itself positions it as IP. It's like you come to us because you like this these four different things, and we're going to continue doing those four different things to so the point where they've just given the heads of those verticals slots on Disney Plus. Star Wars, you get three slots. Marvel, you get three slots. We just need a show. We don't care what the show is. We just need a show to keep people coming in. Uh, and I think what you're gonna see a lot more of from all the companies, but specifically the big three, which are Warner Media, NBC Universal, and Disney, is just say, we don't need to take big bets on new things like Netflix has to do because they don't have IP. Uh, we're just going to recreate Gossip Girl or, and Batman over and over again. We're just gonna keep making Iron Man movies again and again. Uh, and we're just gonna keep making versions of The Office that will exist uh, and Fast and Furious movies. And it works for them. It pulls in more of a billion dollars. And I think that's actually what you're seeing, not to go off on a tangent, but with movie theaters, the idea that the movies that got delayed versus the movies that went straight to VOD, the movies that got delayed were movies that they were convinced would bring in $800 million plus. And those were all big IP movies right. versus the movies that went to VOD. They were like, hey, these are movies we think might have been great award contenders. These Sonic the Hedgehog are- was great. Okay. <laughs> it was a great movie. <laughs> it, was- it got the theatrical release. But like that's that was the big uh, debate I kept having with people where they were like Mulan will go to Disney Plus. I was like, there's no way because that's a one that's a one billion dollar movie for Disney. Like Mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen. But Artemis Fowl, not big IP for them. It's not been done, and they need content on Disney Plus. Sure. So I think that's what you'll see a lot of is the idea that movie theaters will become and studios will become big, big, big IP, and like that's their thing. Mm -hmm. And then they'll have smaller what we would consider in the '90s as independent or mid-tier budget films that are just now streaming exclusives. Like right. it's called, you fill it a hole here. <laughs> that is that is great. Uh, let me let's bring up a question from one of the commenters, Josh. If you have uh, here we go. Are are people conditioned not to pay for short form content? All tech is human ass. Are people conditioned not to pay for short form content that is made for our phone? Like, is there a dissonance for that? Like the idea that the distribution being a phone-based outlet, do people have a cognitive dissonance that it's free? Interested in Ryan's thoughts on this specifically, actually. Uh, I think people are conditioned not to pay for any content. Um, I think that's sort of like the baseline. I think for phone-based, like filmed-based content, there is this feeling that I could do that. So why am I paying for that? Which is why I think influencers have instinctually perhaps, or also maybe they've thought about this, uh, monetize themselves more than their content, uh, which is kind of harking back to decisions the Kardashian family made after, uh, you know, the kind of viral success of Paris Hilton and that realm is that they realized that to be a successful transmedia personality, you had to actually monetize yourself. And I think when you're working with just a phone, that's the only thing you've got over the next person because TikTok allows open source filters. They allow any kind of audio. So really all you've got is like you. Um, and that's the hardest thing that someone else can rip off. I, that's my that's my thought. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. And I think on the scripted side of things, there's a, a company called Shorts, Short Form TV. Or it's like Shorts TV or Short Forms TV. Um, and what they do is they just take scripted shorts. So think of what the, think of the Oscar shorts. Uh, and they offer that via OTT platforms. They're usually bundled into cable packages or they're bundled into things like Pluto TV. Um, and they're successful. They're a successful company where people are, they have some subscribers who are willing to pay for it. Others are through advertisement uh, supported platforms, but they work because they fill a specific niche. They do very cool short form 
scripted content that then gets uh, award nominations. So they have a lot of film buffs who watch those shorts. They have a lot of film students who watch those shorts. Uh, Quibi is the really interesting experiment because Quibi thinks that its biggest sellers are its scripted movies, its scripted TV shows, when in fact its biggest sellers are the absolutely insane reality shows that you'll see people record off another phone to share mm -hmm. because they're so absolutely insane. The, what, what, this, what the short form production, uh, sorry, what the short form video is coming from production companies are gonna have to realize is that if they want people to continue to pay for their content, it has to be stuff that they can share. Cause the way I think of content is I watch content to create content. If I watch Netflix, I have my uh, captions on cause I wanna create a tweet with a, based on a meme around it. Like that's how I think of when I watch things, everything mm -hmm. that I watch will then become content. If I'm putting the time in, I want something out of it more than just entertainment cause it's 2020. And so that's what with Quibi, <laughs> they have to realize that if Quibi wants to continue having subscribers and building a subscriber base, they need to find a way for those shows to become viral hits. And that's learning, that's leaning into mobile and being like, I will find, give people a way to share this content. Yeah, there's, a, you, that's a, I saw you tweet that today and I think that's a good point because it actually reminds me of like, even the way that um, any cell phone based product needs another phone to kind of capture it if it doesn't have the ability to capture that. We, previously we had interviewed Leah Williams, who's a writer for Marvel. And she was saying something of what you said, which is that she's now writing, knowing full well that her panels might get tweeted because the way a lot of people consume comics on apps and they could actually screen grab it. And so she's fully aware that she has to think further than just what people are doing on flipping pages, like, like with leaving the captions up. It is content that moves. It actually has to like travel now. It doesn't just sit in its own place. And you're right, Quibi has to like, I, I one of the things about like moving the already being forced to be used on large screens doesn't solve that problem, but it also shows that they're willing to bend to like new things, but they're st still trying to figure it out. Our world is so oversaturated. You can't just be good. You have to be shareable. Yeah. Let's see what the next question. Aaron Batts, do you think, a Aaron asks, do you think apps like TikTok, YouTube can delve into choose your own adventure games like Black Mirror, Rander Snatch, or the video game Detroit become human and others like? Did you guys like Bandersnatch? Personally, I didn't, but that doesn't mean like, like there's a way back in the day, there used to be choose your own adventures on YouTube. Uh, Next New Networks was yeah. the company that did that. And then they got bought by YouTube. So like they, there was an attempt that was back in the days of annotations. Do you guys see that as more, now that we are using phones to consume, do you see like, maybe that's an option? When, when Banner Snatch dropped, my friend actually had like an incredible idea for a uh, choose your own adventure Netflix use case. But I, I, w I wish they would do it, which is romantic, bad romantic comedies like Hallmark movies. Yeah. Because she, and I think the insight was really smart, which is she said that like Banner Snatch eliminates the one thing that would be fun, which is sitting with your family and doing it together, or sitting with your friends and doing it together. Like Banner Snatch is a massive bummer. I think two of them involve like, the character committing suicide. So like, it's not a fun experience. Whereas imagine a terrible Hallmark movie about two uh, Christmas tree decorators that compete and then become lovers. And you could like, you know, choose how that works. And I think that would be a much more fun experience, a more shareable experience. And so yeah. I, I, I think to answer the question, yes, but I don't think anyone's figured out a good way to do it yet. Yeah, I 100% I agree. I think Netflix has two, so Netflix sees a way to do interactive or they think they do and they're, they're really investing in it. They're leaning into it. They have two coming out this month, this month or next month. One is Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt interactive special. Um, and the other is what the other, which I think is actually exciting and is a perfect target audience is a Carmen San Diego choose your own adventure for kids. Mm -hmm. I think kids are already programmed to like mess around with things. Like that's how we I, like, our generation grew up with games. They, this generation is like, <laughs> so they're, they're constantly pressing stuff. So I think a Carmen San Diego mystery where you're having to help solve crime by like figuring things out for kids is a great idea. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt's really interesting because it's a comedy that relies on quick witty one-liners. And it's also a type of show I don't necessarily want to have to worry about pressing a button for. Like I, just want to watch things. And I think this is where a lot of what Quibi wants to do is really interesting, where it's they think people are on their phones to be active, to have an active viewing experience. <laughs> and I think on my phone, when I think of what I use it for, like a TikTok, it's just extremely passive. 
I've it's never like, had a coherent thought using my phone. Exactly. Same. <laughs> or, or like if I take my phone out to look at Twitter, I'm not even really reading Twitter. I'm just kind of, I'm looking for something to do with my hands and I'm scrolling. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that I'm going to watch a show like Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and try to get the jokes and see the references and really pay attention while also choosing a line doesn't make sense to me. Um, I do like the idea though, of Ryan's rom-com Hallmark, like disastrous. Like, that would be really fun. I think they should do that. It's it's also weird that like Netflix is trying to do a choose your own adventure thing at the same time that like one of the biggest entertainment forms in the world is just watching people play video games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like clearly yeah. there isn't really the urge to be interactive is in the group chat next to the let's play. It's not yeah. playing. So I, I almost feel like they're misunderstanding what makes an interactive experience interesting. It's not seeing more of the story. It's like you know, pressing F in the chat for respect. <laughs> that's an excellent point. I think that really gets, that's actually, I've never thought about that. It's a really, really good point. I think that actually gets back to the idea that Netflix and, and Disney are obsessed with a Twitch, TikTok, YouTube, and they're trying to figure that out versus Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, don't care about them. Like they're more than happy doing their own thing. They have the advertisers. They're not thinking about how to do scripted content. YouTube did for two years and it failed miserably for them. Uh, and so they were like, no, we're just going to do our own thing. But I really do think Netflix is obsessed with the idea of trying to figure out the interactivity that Twitch and TikTok and YouTube have. And it just doesn't, they haven't figured it out yet. Well, that's, thank you. The next one, next question. Jake asks, are all these major digital companies conglomerated, much like broadcast television? If so, who owns them? Jake, I think about this. Uh, nowhere will I, like it keeps me up at night thinking about it. Uh, so here's a fun way to think about it um, and kind of who owns everything. Uh, two years ago, The Simpsons and Fox, at the time, Fox decided that after the allegations came up again against Michael Jackson, they were going to remove the season three premiere of The Simpsons because it featured Michael Jackson. Small role, but they're like, we're just going to take it out of syndication. It won't appear on any digital or streaming services, uh, and it's not going to re-air, and, and it won't be in new DVD packages. Um, and people thought, man, this is really bad. Fox has become the perfect example of what a of what corporations can do. And then Disney bought Fox, and they became like the ultimate monolith. And Disney kind of was like, now we're going to shut down a bunch of things, and we're going to control everything. Uh, there are just like in tech, there I think there are the big five, and it's like Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, Amazon, and Apple. Uh, th there's that equivalent right now with entertainment, and it's. Uh, they're and really they're telecom companies. It's AT and T, Comcast, Disney's its own thing. Um, Sony is kind of there, but not really. Um, and I'm forgetting one of them. But they're uh, and and Disney, which owns Hulu now, and they own Fox. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a few companies, most of which are telecom, and that gets into questions about distribution because if AT and T can give HBO Max to AT and T customers and kind of circulate that within them, and Comcast can do Peacock within Comcast. Um, it brings up really important questions about the, the advantages they have, which gets into net neutrality conversations that come up again and again and again. But what you're seeing right now in terms of like how the pandemic is affecting things, I think it's really interesting because it will affect the next year or two, uh, if not more, is that NBC Universal and Warner Media, which are launching streaming services, have these amazing backings that are doing really well because everyone's using the internet and everyone's using their phone. So Comcast and AT&T are seeing huge increases. And they're feeling pretty okay about it. Disney just lost a ten, I think like it's a lot. I can't have the exact number, but it's tens of billions of dollars in the past month in valuation because almost every single division that they have was hit by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And Disney doesn't have a telecom backing. So they don't have anything beyond streaming right now that's actually doing anything. So when we think of who owns these corporations, the conversation isn't even just so much like who owns the content. It's in the going forward, Comcast and AT&T have a huge backing, a huge network of subscribers and customers built in that they can already kind of market to and give things to. And that they're going up against companies like Disney and Sony who do not and are trying to figure out their way in. Um, and for Disney, that's IP. Like what Ryan was saying, for Disney, that is like they have their IP. They know people will come to it. And that's their saving grace right now. That was awe-inspiring. And I also want to tack <laughs> on to the very end of that that – I think the need for telecom backing could, you could view uh, definitely Google's foray into mobile phone technology, but also 
Facebook's urge to like build some sort of hardware or some sort of OS around the same time that they were talking about video being the future of their platform. I think there is this like definite paranoia that if you don't have some sort of physical or, or practical backing for your video, it could all just like fizzle. And I think that is more or less what happened with Facebook video is that ultimately it turned to be turned out to be nothing, you know? Yeah. Right. I'm interested to, if you have any insight on to the, into the Chinese side of it with like TikTok and um, which is ByteDance. And do you see more, uh, I guess, Chinese conglomerates kind of trying to enter the U S market it's now that, especially now that TikTok is really taken off here. So, okay, there's like two parts of this that is kind of interesting. One, uh, I, I went to a panel at VidCon last year uh, hosted by Tencent. And Tencent had this incredibly dystopian way of talking about things where I didn't really understand what they were saying at first, where this woman was on stage and she was saying that we have all of these valuable IPs and we're really interested in accu uh, accumulating IPs. And then she pulls up this massive screen to reveal that what she's talking about are TV shows, movies, football teams and like various other forms of just like intellectual property. And for Tencent, it was all content that could be put into their little silo and then distributed. And they essentially own a monopoly over Western IP because you have to partner with uh, someone to, you know, get it through Chinese censors and things like that. Right. TikTok is a really weird example going the other way because so far it is the only Chinese app to successfully do this. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a little like hoopla currently about where Zoom servers are. And I believe right. that they might be in China. <laughs> and I think that might be what we see more of in the near future, which is like a Chinese, non-Chinese tech hybrid. Mm. But so far, almost every Chinese platform that's tried to go outside of the country has failed. Uh, that said, I did. I was told like the very ominous thing in Beijing in December that uh, the era of China importing things from outside of China is over and the new era is China exporting what they've built. And then I was also told that their AI will be much better because they have much looser restrictions around data. So <laughs> I do I do think that we are we are we are we will probably be entering a post-pandemic world where there is more than one bite dance style company from China that is kind of in control of how we consume probably video. That's fascinating. In future, Beth. Uh, let, let's see the next question. That's that's awesome. Thank you. Kelsey asks Do you prefer short entertainment like TikTok or longer ones from platforms like Disney Plus? Uh, I feel like a lot of people, TikTok has crushed the ability to watch longer content, even YouTube. Uh, I, I, I feel like that happens, though, like in a wave. Uh, that happened with Vine, where all of a sudden Vine was the only thing I had the attention span for, yeah. and I like couldn't think outside of that. And then that went away. I think that like, with every emergent video platform that redesigned, like this happened with Snapchat too, where no one could do anything but use Snapchat. And then all of a sudden, like it got better. I think to make a success, and, and I think what it is, is that to make a successful video platform happen, it has to be addictive. Right. And eventually that will wear off. And then you'll just, and then the successful ones pivot or they evolve or they just, you know, people kind of get used to it. This happened with Twitch where people were like live streaming for literal days and then, and people were just like nonstop consuming content and then it kind of tapers off, but you have to have that. So like if TikTok didn't launch and be hyper addictive, we wouldn't be talking about it right now. It would have died six yeah. months ago. Okay. I also think people uh, use them at the same time. Like I'll speak for myself. I have TikTok on all day, but I'm also watching something. Or I'll give you an example. I spent a weekend watching The Witcher. I watched every single episode. Then I, but I also had TikTok going on, on my phone. I think I was like reading fan fiction because I still do that as like on Tumblr. Like it's not just one thing. And I think what Netflix is. Really I'm watching like. TikTok right now. <laughs> I've been doing it. The, I've been doing it the whole time. Uh, <laughs> I think what like Netflix is really good understanding. TikTok's really good understanding. YouTube and Twitch maybe understand better. Like for, as a creators, they understand better than anyone is that people are not engaging with their content the way that people do when they go to the movies, which is like, I'm in a dark room. This is the thing on my screen. I'm watching this. Um, they understand that people are just kind of looking for things to do as they, as they're doing a bunch of different stuff. So the fact that we can watch something on our computer, on a TV and our phone at the same time, as long, that's why Netflix has the binge model where they just release everything at once. Um, that's why TikTok is really easy to scroll through. It's why YouTube auto plays. It's just like, yeah, we know you just have this on. 
Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I, I mean, over the course of just watching content and like consuming it, it does change the way that people do like have attention spans. But I, I, I do agree that it is a shifting. It's almost like it, in the future, when we look back on it, we will be able to probably analyze those waves of like content approaches and then changes. I mean, there was there was a time when people played together to make a Pokemon game go, Pokemon Go. Like, it was the best day on the internet. That's yeah, it was ever great. Happened. It was amazing. <laughs> so I think it is, it, the models create like in real time. Let's do one last question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Bridget asks, Netflix and other streaming services have money coming in from subscriptions and ads, but where else does the revenue come from? How is the revenue model different than traditional broadcasting? This is actually a really great question. It's a solid question. Uh, so Netflix, ha Netflix is all, um, subscriber revenue and then they have investors who also invest. Netflix also has, I think at this point, $20 billion worth of debt. Like Netflix is not made a profit. Uh, <laughs> people just keep investing in Netflix because they really believe in Netflix. And today Netflix's stock took over Disney's, like their valuation story is more than Disney. So that's where they get the investor confidence and investors then give them money and then subscriptions go up. Um, what you'll see, you, what we're seeing a rise of, and I think this will be the tw story of 2021, 2022, are the streaming services with really funny names. And I think Ryan once replied to me with like, are these made up? It's like Tubi, it's Tubi, uh, Zumo. It's like all these weird, Pluto TV are all these ad supported free services that are being bought by companies. So Fox bought Tubi, Viacom CBS bought Pluto. And what they're doing is going, we can bring these to uh, actually kind of what media does with Comscore. We're going to bring these numbers to investors and advertisers and go, Hey, we have 25 million daily active users or monthly active users. Um, invest, put your ads here, invest in this. And they will. And then what they do to offset that is then launch subscription services. So that's where Viacom CBS has Showtime. They have CBS All Access. They're launching a newer version of CBS All Access. Um, and then Disney has the same kind of thing as Netflix, except that Disney uses its revenue from its bigger divisions to offset the cost of Disney Plus. So that would have been up until last month, uh, Parks and Films. Uh, Parks is their biggest by far. Parks is a 20 to $25 billion a year business for Disney. Um, it used to be extremely safe to the point that it was boring. Now they've lost that entire revenue. Um, so Disney has to reevaluate, but for them specifically, they offset the price of their subscription services with their revenue from their other companies, uh, sorry, other divisions that they then funnel into it. But most of them are either investor and subscription model or advertisement and subscription model. Excellent. Thank you. I also think it's like very funny that the, the revenue question is to deal with the fact that video is collaborative. It takes people, people want money, you know, so things, the price goes up, right? Yeah. But I think this thing that I've noticed since the pandemic has started is the rise of like ultra collaborative video. The 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 meme where like I pass my makeup brush to Julia, oh, yeah. you know, and they're getting more sophisticated. And so like the 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 techno futurist in me wonders if we will look back on this period of time and laugh at the idea that it required millions of dollars to create a really intricate, highly produced ensemble video. And that there could be a shift where this is just a thing that we do and it's fine. And that like, and then that would also have to change like the way video is thought about. But I, I do think it's still, it's funny to think that we're still very much in the infancy of like what video is and what video online even is. So yeah. that, you know, it's exorbitant costs, but I don't think that's going to be forever, which makes a lot of these problems kind of hilarious. I had a really interesting conversation with someone who remained anonymous, but they work for one of the major late nights. And I was saying, hey, dude, no offense, but um, your show that you work on is so much better when it's just a YouTube thing, like without the fake applause and the person coming out and the thing. Is it Stephen Colbert? <laughs> yeah, it's, I was speaking to Steve-O. Uh, <laughs> no, but and they were saying they've gotten the same response and the network has gotten the same response. And it's kind of, it's mind boggling for them because they don't understand why people would think this is more entertaining. And I'm like, well, the whole point of a late night show is intimacy. Like what you've been trying to replicate for years is taking on what late nights have done for the, for the last decade is tried to be YouTube. They've instituted YouTube tactics. They've instituted what uh, uh, they've broken up their shows into different style YouTube videos that, that go viral, that do really well and trending. But what people are wanting to watch is just a conversation between two people. And on a, on a TV, traditional TV format, 
you know, they're not Johnny Carson. It doesn't feel like there's anything there. It's really vulnerable. And there's something intimate, but when they're at home and they're just talking to each other and they're just going back and forth and making jokes, it's really charming and fun and it's low budget. Uh, and I think people really respond to that. And so I was thinking about what you were saying, Ryan, just now, like there is an intimacy with YouTube and TikTok, like people in their bathrooms that you, that you can't, that's so authentic. Trying to recreate that genuinity in pie production shows and movies is automatically lost and you lose the warmth. If video, if online video is vinyl, then high production stuff is like remastered digital releases of songs, right? Where it's like, oh, it's good. And I can tell it's better like produced, but it's not as warm. And I want to just listen to vinyl. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing now. I, I also think that like in a weird way, he kind of always has been at the forefront of, the, of things like this, but like Conan O'Brien has done something very interesting the last couple yeah. of years where he have his shows runtime by 30 minutes. So now it's only a half hour long. And he basically uses the extra budget that would have gone into making a traditional late night show into creating more or less like a very high production content studio that lives across YouTube and podcasts. Yeah. And this like transmedia sort of way of distribution, just, just distributing content makes a lot more sense and makes him more nimble and able to adapt to things. Like he, I don't think he's launched, launched a Twitch channel, but he's doing like let's plays and he's, he's doing the things that we think about. So it makes sense that like, that's probably how things are going to go from that point on. <laughs> Yeah, and if I could just add a really fun number really quickly, uh, when Netflix first started doing originals, it was 2012, 2013. Uh, the budget around then for a lot of network studio, not network, for television studios was, um, networks, I should say television networks, was about a billion dollars. Like they would do, like that's our content budget. In the seven years since then, Netflix's current production budget is just under $18 billion and everyone has had to increase that. So what YouTubers are doing with a camera and absolutely no money has now taken Netflix and everyone to spend times ten billion dollars to get to a point where they can kind of create keep up with uh, each other, and that will end. Soon. It's almost like that's broken and can't co continue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. I can't. I can't ask anything better than the way you just summed that up at the end. That was perfect. Thank you so much. I want to thank both of you for being here. This was absolutely enlightening. Like hearing it from the experts is incredible. We really appreciate it. Uh, just I want to ask you guys if you want to plug anything or any future things you want us to follow or events that are coming up uh, before we go. Uh, follow me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Broderick. Um, I'm doing a quarantine podcast that Julia comes on every once in a while to um, talk about uh, a really hot take she has. So if you liked this, uh, this, uh, <laughs> you know, I, uh, listen to that um and yeah that twitter's twitter's good um i am not as productive as ryan so you can follow i have no podcast so you can follow me on twitter at loudmouth julia and then i um write quite a bit uh about all of this uh daily at the verge we can follow my work there thank you both very much and uh my last one is just follow us at digitalvoid.media and you'll see our upcoming shows that we're gonna be doing weekly in the now virtual quarantine editions. But this has been very, very awesome. Thank you guys so very much for this. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Be healthy and stay well and see you soon. <laughs>